people who are hearing all of this. And then Latinus will stand up and he will begin to speak about how I wish, he says, uh, we had called at line uh, 365, how I wish that we had called a council earlier, right? Uh, the, uh, what an ominous war, he says. This is bad news. He says, I don't think the Trojans at line 370, I don't think the Trojans can be beat. He says, all lie in shambles. Look with your own eyes. Feel with your own hands. I blame no one, he says. The most that Valor could do, Valor was done. We have fought the good fight with all our kingdom's power. Now, for those of you who know anything about St. Paul and the New Testament scripture, you know that this we have fought the good fight sounds so much like 2 Timothy 4, 7 that it does and has begged the question of a number of scholars. Paul was a Roman citizen, had to know Virgil's Aeneid, and how much of Virgil's Aeneid finds its way into the letters of Paul and, of course, if you're studying your St. Augustine Christian theology. That is a fascinating question. We don't have time. I'll just mention it, though, at 3A. You can do your own research. I think it's worth it to take a look at what Paul understood and took from his uh, study of Virgil's Aeneid. The poem is ubiquitous within the Roman world, so it would make sense that Paul would know something of this poem, right? Latinus has his plan. It's a simple one. Let's give back the Trojans, or let's give the Trojans a, um, some land, and let's settle and have a peace treaty, and uh, let's give them 20 ships, so if they want to you know, start looking around for other places to go, they have a way to get there. And Dancy's then will rise. And uh, now at line um, um, four, uh, 405 or so, he, we're told, aggressive as always, stung by Turnus's glory, spurred by smarting, barely hidden envy, a lavish spender, his rhetoric even looser, but a frozen hand in battle. So in other words, we've got insults that are coming Drancis' uh, uh, way uh, right away. He will uh, begin to speak about Turnus, but he calls him he. And then finally at 4.30 he says, Turnus, surrender to king and country their due rights. Why keep flinging your wretched people into naked peril? You are the root and spring of all the Latians' griefs. There's no salvation in war. Peace, we all beg you, Turnus, bound with one inviolable pledge of peace. I've come first, the man you think your enemy. And what if I am? I'm here to implore you now. Pity your own people. Surrender your pride. You've been beaten. Now retreat. Well, in other words, he says, come, Prince, if you have the spine, if you have any spark of your father's warring spirit, look, your challenger calls you out to fight. In other words, Drancis says, hey, Turnus, if you're so committed to this fighting, why don't you go out and fight against Aeneas all by yourself? The final speaker, number three, is Turnus, obviously, at 450. And it's brilliant the way Virgil can co construct this kind of tension. There's tension on the battlefield, but now we've got tension in the hall, the political halls. And he says to Drancis right away, he, he's going to say to, Dr to, to Drancis right away, Always a mighty flood of words with you, Drances, when battle demands our fighting hands. Whenever the Senate's called, you're the first to show your face. In other words, you're a politician, but you ain't no fighter. But there is no earthly need to fill these holes with the talk that flies so bravely from your mouth. Save as you are, while the ramparts keep the enemy out and the trenches still don't overflow with blood. So, bluster away with your bombast. That's your style. Brand me for cowardice, Drances. Once your arm has left as many piles of slaughtered Trojans decked on as many fields with brilliant trophies. And I'm sorry, how many did you kill in the last battle? Oh, that's what I thought. Then you need to just sit down and shut up. He says it. We need to fight. He says, I'm not beaten. He says, I have killed a thousand men in a day, in a single day. What have you done? Well, um, and then he says it at line 480. Of course war provides salvation to the victor, maybe not to the loser. He then says back to Latinus at line 490, I wish I could read this whole speech, it's an amazing bit of rhetoric, but now, Father, I come back to you and your resolves. If you no longer harbor any hope for our armies, if you're so low and at one repulse our forces are totally overwhelmed, good fortune's lost forever. Let us reach out our helpless arms and plead for peace. This is ironic because this is what he's going to do at the very end of the poem, is to actually reach up his arms, his arms for peace to Aeneas. Oh, if only we had a shred of our old courage left. Now you can see it. In other words, note the brilliant irony. Okay, okay, fine, Latinus. If you think we're ready to give it all up, then surrender. I just wish we were half the men that we once were. It's far better to fight and die, he says, spurning the sight of our surrender. The man who falls dying and bites the dust one last time. Why, this is a whole much, so much better. The same storm struck both sides, he says. Then why this shameful collapse? 
before it all begins. And then he says it many times in the history of the world. Many times bad things have turned around for good. Yeah, we don't have Diomedes, but we have other people. Mesopolis is one that he mentions, and then finally he says it at line 515. Camellia too, our, uh, our ally, we have her as well. He says finally, I'll fight Achilles if I, uh, Aeneas if I have to. He said, I will take him on with a will. Let him outfight the great Achilles. Strap on armor the match for his forged by Vulcan's hands. In other words, he says, I'm ready to fight him. I am the new Achilles. It's an interesting idea. Brave Turnus, we might say. While all this is going on, Aeneas has decided to attack, and attack is what he does, and at line 540, a messenger comes on, and then it's just the scream, to arms, to arms, because here comes Aeneas and his Trojans, right? Turnus, we're told, seizing the moment at line 550, he screams to his, citizen and begin, his citizens, and he jumps up, he leaps up, and he's ready to go off to fight, right? And it, we're told, at once, they rush to the walls from all parts of the city, we're told, though, King Latinus himself shocked by the sudden crisis. You get a sense that Latinus was in no way really ready to be the leader of this kind of a situation, right? Um, leaves the council, delays his own noble plans till a better hour. Over and over, faults himself for not embracing Trojan Aeneas with open arms, adopting him as his son to shield the city. We're told that others are digging trenches before the gates, hauling up on their shoulders stones and pikes. The raucous trumpet sounds the signal, and then bloody war. The women um, um, will as well decide they're going to go to Minerva's temple like the Trojan women did, of course, in the story as it was told by Aeneas, ironically, in, uh, in Aeneas 2. Together, along with Princess Lavinia at line 573, uh, cause of all their grief, Virgil says, her lovely eyes bent low. Um, it's interesting that Lavinia plays kind of the role of Helen in all of this. But she never actually says anything. She never speaks in the entire poem. Like um, Tricias and Briseis in the beginning of the Iliad, there, there, there's, no, there's no voice. There's nothing there uh, to be said at all. These are just women who are pawns, tragically, right? They pray, but it's useless praying. We've had a lot of useless praying in Homer and in Virgil, haven't we, right? And then we begin with Turnus's Aristia number two, right? Okay, at 580. And he puts on Pallas's belt and the armor he armors up. The, the fact he puts on Pallas' belt, though not specifically stated, we know that it's about to happen. And of course that will lead to the tragedy at the end for him. And then we got this great epic simile. He's like a stallion bolting the padlock, burst free of the reins at last. He's ready to go. He's ready to go. We then will begin at 590, Camellia's Aristia. And this is an amazing moment in the poem and it begs the question, what was Virgil doing to give this kind of successful story of a woman fighter right in the middle of this poem in this way. It's compelling. Um, she will see Turnus. She will, uh, Turnus will say at, at, at line 603, his eyes trained on the awesome young girl, pride of Italy, princess, what can I do or say to show my thanks? But since that courage of yours would leap all bounds, come, share the struggle with me. So it's fascinating that a fighter as bold as Turnus will turn to Camellia and say, can we share this together? Turnus's plan is ambush, and so he sends Camellia to the frontal attack, and he's going to ambush uh, he's going to ambush Aeneas in the end. We then at 630 will have this interesting cutaway to Olympus where Diana, along with Opus, the, um, the, the, the nymph, will be, have this conversation about why it's all over for Camellia. At line 633, Camellia is moving out to a brutal war, dear girl, strapping on her armor all for nothing. I love her like no one else, Diana says, and it's no new love, you know, that stirs Diana. No sweet lightning bolt of passion. And then we get this amazing little story about where Camellia came from. And we will see this a number of times in literature. I mean, we think of um, um, uh, the Shakespeare's Tempest. I mean, there's so many examples of this where a father raises a daughter um, and, and all, all, all alone without a mother there in her presence and that kind of thing. Um, Mativas is uh, this tyrant, we're told, who basically gets run out of his kingdom. He takes his daughter with him, Camellia. And what he does is he runs into the woods and he's got to get across a river. And so the way he gets across the river with his daughter is he bundles her up and he puts her on a, on a spear and he throws the spear across the river and then he swims and on the other side of the river he picks her up. They, uh, at line 670, it was a, he says, I'll give my child to Diana as a gift. 
and she becomes then this huntress warrior type. Um, he raises Camellia in the mountains from the time she's very young. She learns how to hunt, how to, how to fight. We're told that at line uh, 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 683, we're told she's not interested in, in dressing fine and all of that. No gold band for her hair, no long flaring cape, a tiger skin that covered her head at line 906. It will in fact be her interest in shiny garments and shiny armor that ultimately is her downfall, which is out of interest. We're told many a mother um, in Tuscan cities yearned for her as daughter, but no way. She loves chastity and the hunt, right? She's not raised again by a mother. And then she says it, Diana says it to Opus. She's going to die, but whoever kills her, I want you to use a special arrow and I want you to kill that person. Then we come back to the Trojans. Fever pitch, we're told, at line uh, 720 or so. We have horses that collide so hard that their rib cages break. We have the Latins at 733. That moment, the lines of fighters buckle. Latins routed, sling their shields on their backs and wheel their horses round to the walls as the Trojans drive them on. The picture at 740 is, is of an ocean. We've got this sea of blood. The pictures of Virgil and were brutal. And when a third assault of the whole front walked fast, fighting hand to hand, and each man picked out his man, then truly the groans of the dying men break loose. Weapons, bodies, a sea of blood, massacred riders, half-dead horses riding together now in death, and the pitched battle peaks. We think of that famous painting by Picasso, don't we, of all those different people, uh, all those t tragedies of war, right? Then... We're told that um, elsewhere, black tides of blood, iron clashing, slaughter at 763, fighters striving for death with glory through their wounds. And then all of a sudden we get this line, watch, exulting here, in the thick of carnage, an Amazon, one breast bared for combat. Now, by the way, in the Iliad, we don't really have much mention of these Amazons other than Iliad 3, line 229. We're told something about Priam and the Amazons and fighting against the Amazons. Camellia is one of these Amazons. She is unbelievable as a fighter. Um, she is a fierce young girl, 781. Who is the first and who the first your spear cuts down is the way Virgil will ask it. How many dying bodies do you spread out on the earth? And then the list starts to build up. Camellia has a number of kills through line 790 and beyond. Um, she sees uh, Orantes, who is all decked out in his beautiful armor, and for that one, she runs him down. Easy work, we're told, at 805, with the ranks in full retreat. Spears him through, exulting over his body with all the hatred in her heart, and then she says, Still in the woods, you thought, in flushing game, I find Etruscan hunter. Well, the day is come when a woman's weapons prove your daydreams wrong. Still, you carry no mean fame to your father's shades. Just tell him this. You died by Camellia's spear. Notice this is exactly what Aeneas echoes in an earlier set of lines when he said, well, if you're going to die, you might as well die uh, at my hands. She kills Bute. She kills uh, a supplicant as well, somebody who's actually begging for his life. We get the, the, the uh, Iliadic language. Blow after blow, she hacks him with her axe through armor, bones splitting his skull, more brains from the wound go splashing down his face. Right, so this is some pretty graphic language, isn't it, right? Then all of a sudden we meet um, Aeneas's, uh, Aeneas's uh, um, son, and he thinks he can trick her by saying, hey, you're, you're not a real fighter or you would meet me on foot. So she gets off her pony and then he jumps on his pony to try and one-up her, and, and she's so fast, she just runs down his pony and she kills him. And the epic simile at 850 is stunning. Like Apollo's falcon wheeling down from a crag outraces a dove in flight. Um, all of this Job is watching, right? And all of a sudden then we have Tarshan. He is the, the Etruscan leader. And um, Tarshan is, is, is uh, going to insult, as we have seen this happen many times in the Iliad and then here, insult these warriors at 860 or so. He says, what's your fear, you Tuscans, forever death to shame? They're all running away from Camellia. Always slacking off. What cowardice saps your courage? What? Is a woman routing squadrons strong as ours? In other words, 
Come on, you got to be kidding me. You guys are running from a girl. This, by the way, reminds us as we, as, we, as biblical readers, this reminds us of that ju uh, that Judges 9:53 um, story about Abimelech who's climbing up a ladder and a stone, a millstone's thrown by a woman on his head, and he begs somebody to kill him because he doesn't want the rumor to ever get out that he was killed by a woman. We got the same game being played here. Why have swords or useless lances gripped in our fists? In other words, what's the point of all your weapons if you're not going to use them? But you're not slow when it comes to nightly bouts of love. When the curved flute strikes up some frantic Bach and uh, dance, and those you like to, you like women when at night you can sleep with them. What's going on here, right? Linger on for the feasts and cups at the groaning board. That's your love, you lost. Till the seer will bless and proclaim the sacrifice, and the rich victim lures you into the deep groves. In other words, you love to have you love to have sex with a woman. You just don't want to fight against her. What is going on with you? We then will have. Um, 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 Tarshan, who will fight against uh, Venulius. Remember, Venulius is the one who went uh, to Diomedes. We've got um, we've got them fighting. And at line 883, swift as a golden eagle seizes a snake and towers into the sky, talons nodding round it, claws clutching fast, but the wounded serpent writhes in its rippling coils, stiffens, scales bristling, hissing through its fangs as it rears its head. But all the more the eagle keeps on digging into its struggling victim, its hooked beak ripping away, its wings thrashing the air. So, Trajan weep, sweeps his kill right from the tiger's columns. It's, I mean, this is, uh, this is Virgil showing that anything Homer can do, I can do just as well, if not better. It's quite remarkable. Then, all of a sudden, we meet Ararens. And Ararens is going to stalk Camellia, and Camellia is going to actually spy him at 9.05 at a long range, and he's going to be gleaming in Phrygian gear, spurring a lathered warhorse decked with coat of mail, its brazen scales meshing with gold-like feather stitched. She likes all of the fashion, and so she is somewhat distracted by this. In fact, she stalks him wildly, we're told, at 917, reckless through the ranks, a fire with a woman's lust for loot and plunder, which is really interesting that Virgil would say it this way, because, of course, if you've if you know the Iliad, and we've read it, haven't we, that it is the loot, it is the, the, the time, as we use the term, it is the Scooby Snacks that motivates all of the men. And here it's almost like, well, you know women, they got it, they got to go to the mall and buy lots of stuff. It's, it's, an, inter, it's an interesting uh, line, because this will be the explanation as to why it happens. We're going to have Arenas who's going to fling a spear at line 920, and he's going to say a special prayer. He says, Father, grant our shame be blotted out by our spears, almighty God Apollo. I'm not bent on plunder, stripped from a girl, no trophy over her corpse. My other feats of arms will win me glory. If only this murderous scourge drops dead beneath my strokes, back I'll go to my father's town, unsung. In other words, he says, I just want to kill this woman. I don't need any glory, any kleos. We're told at line 930, Apollo heard the prayer, and will that part of the prayer that would win the day, but parties scattered abroad on the ruffling winds, that Arunus should cut Camellia down in sudden death, that he granted true. But not that his noble land should see him home again, and the gustling south wind swept that prayer away. In other words, he will get jacked, and that's exactly what happens. Camellia does not see it coming at 940, and the spear went ripping through her under her naked breast. We're told that she rides with one breast free and all of that, and it stuck deep and hammered home and drank her virgin blood. We're told then, like the wolf that's killed some shepherd or hulking oxen before attacking spears can catch him, races off at once, darting into the pathless hills for cover. He knows he's done some outrage, line 950. Frantic now, Ariris tucks his trembling tail between his legs and heads for the woods. So, Ariris, shaken, slinking from sight, content with a bear escape, looses himself in the milling lines of fighters. Camellia will die. She calls to her best pal, Asa, and before she dies, she gives one last command, and it's get to Turnus and tell him what's happened. And then she, and then she dies. And then we have at line 968, important lines, because they will be echoed at the end of our poem. With Camellia's last words, she lost her grip on the reins, and all against her will slipped down to the ground. Little by little she grew cold, and wholly freed of her body, laid down her head as her neck drooped limp in the clutch of death. And she let her weapons fall. Camellia's life breath fled with a groan of outrage down to the shades below. We're going to hear this exact same line repeated in Book 12, line 11, 12, when Aeneas kills Turnus. 
Of course, we know about this Shades Below stuff because of Book 6, the, the brilliant construction of this poem. It's, a, it's at this point that it is over for the Latins. Once they see Camellia dead, Opus is going to make sure that she will uh, take care of Araris, who um, um, is going to have to pay. We're told at line 1000 that she sees him gleam in his armor, puffed up with pride, and she says it. Why running away, she shouts. Step right up. Just come this way to die. Collect the reward you've earned for Camellia's death. Just think you are to die by the arrows of Diana. And that said... We're told a bow is shot. Um, we're told that Opus pulls the bow back. When we think about uh, uh, Odysseus killing all those suitors, don't we? Pulls the bow back so far that almost uh, the wood almost almost kisses, and then he's jacked. The Latians then we're told just run like crazy back to their city. Nothing can stop the Trojans, and yet at the city walls we're told home the Latians go. Slack bows on sagging shoulders, galloping hoofbeats pound the rutted plain with thunder. As a dust storm dark as night goes whirling toward the walls, the women, the mothers, stand at the lookouts, beating their breasts, raising the women's shrilling wails to the starry sky. We think about the fall of Troy. The killing goes on through the gates. It's a ghastly bud bloodbath which follows defenders killing, uh, killed at the entries, enemies flung on swords, shut out in front of their parents' faces, eyes streaming tears, some pitch headlong into the trenches pressed by the rout, some charge wildly, reins flying, ramming the gateways, blocked by the rugged posts, and even mothers up on the ramparts strive, 10, line 1040. Their genuine love of country marks the way. They'd seen Camellia fight. They hurl their weapons with trembling hands, daring to do the work of iron with pikes of rugged oak and poles charred hard, defending their city walls. They all burn to be the first to die. Turnus will get the bad news. He returns, and at line 1060, he spies Aeneas, savage in full armor, and caught the tramp of marching infantry, battle stallions panting. They would have clashed at once and tried their luck in war, but the ruddy sun has plunged his weary team in the western sea, and as daylight slips away, he brings the nightfall on, now both armies come to a halt before the city, building dikes to fortify their camps. Some have qualified this as the third.